All right, so let's get started. So uh, my right hand side represent customers, <laughs> and left hand side represent uh, uh, WSO2 architects, right? So uh, goal of the uh, panel is to look at um, this process, basically the selection, and also challenge of deployments, etc., from both the perspectives, right? So to get things started, uh, let me ask um, from my right hand side uh, to talk a little bit about the uh, process of selecting a middleware tool. Uh, like say, in your organization when you start a project, how does things get started? How, like what kind of things you look for? Then how do you select a tool? So that we can get some understanding what customers would try to do. Right, then we'll go into the right hand side and see how they look at the same thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can start. So, uh, so in Uber, basically the way that a project life cycle starts with a, uh, what we call an RFC. So the first engineer and its manager come up with the um, a RFC document um, that detail the, uh, what they want to do this, what the system's supposed to do, and uh, like an overview design of the system, and then and like uh, send it out to the entire engineering organization for other people to review. Uh, the purpose of doing that is uh, Uber. It's like a, I mean, um, large size. It's not. It's a good size company. Uh, so with thousands of engineers. So um, we want to try to avoid duplication of efforts. Uh, so that's uh, why we start sending out RFC. And so after the RFC has been uh, circulated around for about a week or two, and so if there's no disapproval, there's no like uh, duplication. Um, so supposedly they, they can, the team can start work on the project. Um, so doing like, um, so they basically we need to evaluate all the possible um, s solutions, whether it is already available in open source or uh, we need to build it in-house. So they need to evaluate like, for example, performance and scalability and security and all this kind of uh, expat. Um, so yeah, after that, they, I mean, for the next few months, I mean, they should be start working on it and have a timeline to reach the milestone and, um, and then start it like to talk with like, uh, like either they come with a use case or with some customers on have their own use cases and start like, I mean like doing alpha testing and then finally go to like a production uh, launch. Yeah. So I let Francisco. Mm -hmm. We are of course different. We are Capgemini is a system integration company. So we have to somehow suggest to our customer the good uh, solution. The approach is less technology, of course, because we have to feed some business needs. So they come to us, like in the case of, of Uva, also uh, every customer with their needs. And respect to, to this, we design a possible solution. Always with an architectural vision that at the very beginning is logical. Okay. Then uh, we begin to discuss about possible product. And of course, here comes a lot of different things. There are something related to customer uh, constraints, uh, for example, uh, related to, to money and, and cost, of course, or they want something that is really cool and, uh, uh, and uh, well appreciated from the analysts. And on the other part, there is Capgemini that suggests their favorite solution. For this reason, about three, three years ago, we decided to begin to invest on WSO2 middleware platform and to have it as an internal asset to propose in case where the customer was quite open. So not going with Oracle, Tipco, Software AG, or the middleware company, you know, but try to push something that we think is different, that is w, WSO2. So for us, uh, of course, who drive is uh, the customer, but we have the possibility to really somehow, uh, let's say, suggest a technology. 
and in, the, in this last period we are pushing a lot uh, uh, your solution. Uh, so, for the uh, audience, so actually feel free to ask questions. So, uh, so the format I would follow is that we'll discuss. But if you have a question, please put your hands up, and then in between the questions, we'll take those as well. So, those can be about this discussion, also from the earlier talks. So, uh, then let me follow up uh, with the. Francisco and Sui, the, is it common for your organization to bring in uh, like external products, especially open source products as part of your solution? Um, so I think Capgemini case, of course, right? Because the, <laughs> by definition, being a system integrator, they'll do it a lot. But I think from Uber side, we, uh, so I think uh, the model is a little bit different. Is it common for Uber to bring in to like tools from outside? Yeah, I mean, uh, in I think in our early stage uh, when uh, we experienced like rapid growth, uh, so we do have like uh, uh, bring in like uh, external uh, product uh, from the outside. Um, so, but as as we grow and so. Um, we find out that, I mean, uh, like some product, for example, was not able to scale up uh, with our uh, scale. Uh, so um, basically, we, we would like, uh, in that case, we would spend time and engineering hours to uh, build our own. Uh, I think, yeah, but I mean, we, I mean, if there's external product that is, uh, um, um, better suited for the purpose and can scale to our uh, business and we would definitely uh, look into that because uh, yeah it's always like uh, I mean it's always a cost and scale and if efficiency uh, balance yes between, yeah if it's a good fit it can save a lot of time yeah right? yes um, so now let me go to the other side and ask Suho and Anjan on because they see customers comes coming in and basically looking for adapt the projects it could be I mean they come at different levels like sometimes they had just read it about somewhere right for example they may have read Uber is using that and see have a look at it versus it may be they come with after a lot of investigation so let me ask uh, from Suho and Anjana what do they see what kind of things people look for, like, and how does engagement look like? Uh, okay, I, I'll start. Okay, um, so usually, so at WH2 for with other products also, for with uh, analytics products also. So as I see, the first impression matters. So what they do is they will like initially come and play with the products and see like uh, how usable it is, like how how it works well in the first time itself. And uh, so, so most of the judgment happens then itself. So, uh, like, uh, so that's what we strive to do with our products also, like uh, the make the first experience better uh, and make it productive. So, uh, so then they will, of course, move on to other specific features and so on, like what the product can do, like uh, the more specific stuff. And uh, yeah, then they will move on to like things like, for example, okay, how can you do a deployment, like efficient deployment with the product, and so on. So, like they're going to go into that level. Like uh, those things, then those things matter. Like how easily can you set up the product, and uh, how you can maintain the product, and uh, then like ultimately how you can support the product. So then they will uh, uh, go into details like, okay, how much of expertise you guys have. Uh, to support these technologies and so on, especially if you are like if you are integrating a, like for example, an open source product into our own uh, products, uh, like if you guys have the expertise and how 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 knowledgeable are you in this area and so on, so uh, so we make sure like we cover all these uh, aspects uh, when we basically uh, market and sell the products, so uh, then they basically feel safe and like feel confident to actually come and use the product and. Uh, like at the end, like hopefully buy the products. So yeah, I think that's what we follow. Yeah, so for 
to add uh, what Anjana said, like when it comes from the customers, so they, uh, I see like they usually have a use case in mind, like okay, I want to do this. So they usually come and ask whether that can be done. So that's the main thing. So, uh, so we usually have a first call that discuss and explain, try to explain how this can be done. Uh, maybe like with some presentation as well, and then we usually recommend customers to go for a quick start program. So a quick start program basically covers the uh, take take uh, uh, the most complex use case out of their use cases and try to implement a lean uh, solution out of that. So it just only work for that, but we just try to do that and demonstrate uh, how it can be done uh, so that uh, they can continue that process. And uh, another thing also, I, I also see is like certain customers like who are very small companies, they also have uh, issues like if you say, okay, you want to deploy store like or uh, Spark or whatever said, like they also have limitations in number of nodes that they get, the, the running cost. So in earlier, uh, in earlier product like the, the BAM, we had to deploy about lots of nodes to process the stuff because Hadoop is distributed and so on and so forth. So that has that had a negative impact on us. So we worked hard to make the simple things very simple and for simple use cases we can just work with two nodes. So that is also one of the uh, key things that like when it comes to operational and the costing side that affects a lot. So we try to make two node wo always work for 99% of the use case and if it is really complex and you are doing way too much of work, then we try to scale it beyond that. Okay, so uh, now let me ask a little bit technical question. This is for uh, Sui and Suho, who are our streaming analytics uh, or real-time analytics experts. So now, I'm sure most of you know there's a lot of interest in the topic of real-time analytics. But like for example, if you read the content around that, the, the term you see is uh, this term called streaming, uh, pro stream processing. The example projects are like Strom, uh, Apache Spark, etc. Right. So this is the common what you would hear. But if you follow the today's discussion, etc., we'll uh, hear this term complexity and processing. This is actually a very old term. It's uh, it comes from a long time back. Uh, so uh, let me ask, like, as a designer of a, such a project, and also user and somebody who think about uh, the complexity and processing, what do you get? Why do you why do you need complexity and processing in addition to stream processing in these kind of use cases? So maybe so you can. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I can I can start. Um, so one of the reason that we choose complexity and processing, um, it's uh, at the time uh, when we. Um, when we start building the platform, there's a lot of, uh, first there's a lot of like uh, people asking around whether they can use it to do uh, detect fraud. Um, so, for example, in China, uh, when Uber expanded China, we has encountered lots of different type of fraud, and so can, so of course you can like uh, we have like a data warehouse that we, which you can run SQL queries on top of the data, but the lag is far behind I means like sometimes can take a day for the data to populate it uh, in the data warehouse uh, for query and but this kind of fraud that we basically need to we need to do in real time um, to prevent the damage um, so when we look at and complex event processing I mean it's uh, uh, the concept I mean has been used for fraud detection I mean the path especially those are pattern detection stuff um, that is not common to like uh, SQL, uh, which has been very like uh, useful in I mean like uh, detecting uh, weird type of patterns of the uh, fraudulent users. So that's why uh, first we start looking into the field, and the second thing is uh, at the time when we build the system, uh, we try to do it generic in a generic way. We don't want to like every someone comes in, we uh, help them to write a data processing pipeline, uh, and deploy and maintain it, and it's going not, not going to scale. 
with just a few engineers. So, um, and we think of like, well, can we borrow the idea of like SQL, right? Can we do it in a decollective way instead of people, um, instead of you tell, I mean, uh, how to do it, right? You program, that's basically you tell the computer how to do it. You tell the computer what to do, right? And that's uh, much more clear and easy to understand and um, less error prone. Um, so at the time when we look at all different options like uh, Storm, uh, Spark, we used Storm before. Uh, we also active looking into Spark and uh, Flink, uh, which is new. Um, but they don't have like really um, declarative support on the stream processing. Um, they have very nice, uh, some of them have very nice table API, but it still require uh, programming. Uh, or you write your own basically logic and it's statically compile and deploy, which is uh, tedious. Um, so when we look at city, it comes with a full support of uh, uh, declarative query language, which offer lots of uh, features like uh, UDF extensions and all sorts of like uh, uh, operators like window aggregation, aggregation and pattern detection, which is uh, very nice. Um, so that's, uh, and also we did an evaluation of the performance and the prototype uh, that basically take in uh, some of the largest Harris workload uh, that integrate the city with uh, uh, SAMHSA and it works well. And so, yeah, then that's why we, uh, yeah, choose city. Yeah. Can I have the... Yes, yes, please. The, the point is that I think they do two completely different work at the end. If you think a complete big data architecture, you have a batch layer, usually a speed layer, and on top of them, uh, below a streaming, uh, a streaming component, and on top of them, uh, a complex event processing, and usually a machine learning. Because if you need to do really complex contextual action at any moment, you get all the power of the batch history compared in real time with what is happening in a particular context to trigger an event. For example, we had developed this architecture in a really important telematics company that work for insurance. And so they have to trigger some action when there is crash to call, uh, to call help. So it's really also critical from customer perspective. And of course, there are all the components, and all these components do really different job. In some cases, if the landscape is easy, you can uh, somehow use one component to do also the work of the other. But if you think at a very high level perspective with a, a complex architecture, so not only for a use case, but a really big data landscape, what they call big data into action, you need for sure both the components. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think Francisco make a very important point and he also like if you look at the Uber use case, also you would see that you use both. There's complexion processing but the stream processing because the some size is stream processing basically. So the point is uh, basically when we discuss this we are not saying that oh, throw away stream processing and use complexion processing but they s solve different two levels of problems. Uh, which, which is very interesting. Uh, so let me uh, let Suho answer also. Uh, also, Suho try to tell, okay, why, like, uh, why do you think somebody should, like, when you're looking at these problems, should go for uh, WSO2 solution in, instead of something else, trying to also uh, differentiate. So. So, um, um, so Sui also mentioned like there are a lot of stream processing engines. So, um, so what they basically try to do is, okay, if an event comes into the system, you have to route that to the different places. So, and you have to route that in a consistent way and fast way. So that is what stream processing is all, all doing. So. When we try to do like a simple counting sample, like you just want to count number of occurrences, uh, those kind of implementation is 
those can be easily implemented on that because that's very simple logic. But when you want to implement same counting within a window of operation, like what count lasts five minutes, or things like that, then implementing such windows are way too complicated. So you have to write Java logic and you have to find out when to expand stuff and the logic to do those things are so complex. So that is the main reason that we came up with the Siddhi, which is kind of a platform which helps you to do all of those stuff. And, and on top of that, we also build the query language so that you can basically write everything in, in, in as queries. So even we have window uh, as time window and stuff, we can even extend that. Like we can extend and build different type of windows like unique time window. You want to just hold the unique events of that, you can also implement a unique time window just extending the time window concept. So the UDFs comes really uh, helpful on those cases and since there is a platform that basically helps you okay, to tell you, okay, now you have to expand, now you have to change and all of those and thread management and everything is handled in between. So it's way too easy for you to extend and do stuff. So I think that's one of the reason that uh, Uber is also using uh, Siddhi extensively. And the differentiation between, okay, what's complex event processor and WSO2 uh, CEP with a general case is we do stream processing. The first important thing is like we do event by event processing instead of, you know, rather than doing micro batches. So which helps us to basically do event correlation in much fine grained manner. So we can basically identify different correlations. So fraud detection kind of scenarios are very useful on that. And apart from that, we have also built so much of extensions, like there's an extension repo, I say, uh, and there's also a lot of customers contributing to that. So we have anomaly detection, machine learning capabilities, so lots of rich, uh, uh, rich features have been added to the real-time capability. So that makes your, the whole development much easier. Like whenever we work with a customer, when there is a new thing that we, like, we implement, we always add that to the extension store. So that likewise we have added a lot of use cases. We have tried to generify them and implement it so that it can be reused by someone else. So Marco models and identifying rare sequences are something that we have also added recently. So those kind of things are like uh, help you to do those things much faster. And apart from that, we also found out uh, incremental processing is being uh, the key thing. So we are also in the process of including the incremental processing into the system. So which makes your streaming analytics way too easy, like you really don't need to do uh, very, very big, big data deployments and uh, store and process like in, in Hadoop kind of manner. You can do everything in streaming case. So that's, I think, the key advantage. Okay, uh, any questions from the audience? Okay, so we'll, we'll continue, but okay. So, okay, I think uh, everybody paint a very beautiful picture, but uh, let's, let's try to look at some of the challenges, right? So let me ask uh, Sui and Francisco, like, could you talk about any, like, any challenges in the process, like from the point that you start looking at WSO2 uh, products to the point that you actually deployed it, what are the challenges and what may be useful for other people to uh, know if they're trying to do the same thing? Oh, okay, I can start. Um, so uh, when we first look at the uh, WSO city, uh, I think initially what we did is we did a prototype um, by integrating uh, Storm and with city. Um, so I think a challenge initially is we, um, like after we deploy is we find some uh, put, uh, bugs, like uh, we, I think we find uh, some like uh, uh, memory leak before in the join. And so, and then I think I raised the questions to the, the WSO2 people. Uh, I think, uh, and then we, I think schedule a meeting and yeah. So was this at the Stack Overflow or where was the question? Uh, it's a, I think it's a memory, I suspect it's a memory leak. Uh, no, no, sorry, uh, the, where did you ask the question? Is it in the main list or in? 
Um, uh, I forgot how I get contact. Okay, somebody answered somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Important. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I think I. Yeah, I, I can't remember. Yeah, okay. sorry. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I mean, but overall, it's uh, very helpful. I mean, I, I get contact. I mean, uh, with uh, Soho, which is the architect of the product, and I mean, get lots of insight of like what is going on and what's the future and how can we, uh, like, uh, the, I mean, take the right release version uh, to be used uh, for our and also we raise our concern. As I said before about the uh, uh, multi tenancy uh, problem that we face, and then, um, I mean, I saw talk to, told me that uh, they uh, are converting the model to be um, like everything to be processed in the same single thread instead of uh, a thread pool, uh, which is very uh, useful. Um, yeah, um, yeah, I think that's that's about. The, the challenge we face, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, and I was thinking to one experience we do together with WS2. I think that the message, it's, it's important that every time that we, have a, we had a problem in WS2, the, the team of WS2 was there. And uh, it was not so different from other technology. You have, you encounter the same problem. Of course, but the difference is WSO2 people, I can say. Uh, and one example, we, we chose uh, three years ago a very difficult use case to demonstrate to one of our customers the value of WSO2 that was to live this in real time, I'm talking of three years ago, living uh, real time analytics on uh, the API calls on a very critical services. The, the company was uh, an important, uh, the most important European media company, and they have all the rights of the major uh, football uh, championship and league, also the, the, the Champions League. So there are some time, like the final of uh, the Champions League, where the throughput is, uh, the peak is completely unpredictable. And in this case, we simulated the same traffic they had in such type of, of event with WSO2 team to show the real-time capabilities of, uh, in this case, of, uh, of the API, so the monitor of uh, the API. And I think in 10 days, we built completely this POC uh, together. And so I think that really the difference between other companies with we we work every day, of course, as system integrated, is the, the commitment of, uh, of the people for, for the customer satisfaction. It's really a great culture. Yeah, thanks, Francisco, yes. Uh, so, uh, Suho from the, uh, Suho and Angela, the, uh, so I think like, for example, for these examples we talk about shows uh, the, uh, okay, in, uh, okay, one form the customer engage with WSO2 is that when they get a problem. Right, so, uh, but uh, can it be, can they go, can they work more closely? Like, is, like what are the avenues for, of communication? How to give feedback? Uh, could you like, could you tell it from the developer's point of view, what you see and what's useful? Uh, how, how they can get the feedback, any ideas into the system itself? Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, basically when we develop uh, our products, so we also very much like uh, the customers to get engaged with the community, with, uh, with us and all, all, uh, all others. So uh, mainly, so basically we have all the communication, the mailing list uh, as public lists. So everything we design, like architect and uh, even the implementation details, we, we, we discuss in the open mailing list. So, um, so any anyone who's interested, customers and any any other person can uh, openly come to those lists and discuss uh, any any matters. So, even if you have like uh, any suggestions, uh, any improvements and ideas, you can of course come to those and 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 discuss. So, and uh, we we ourselves very much like the feedback, so we can improve our products and give a better experience to the end users eventually. So. Um, so uh, likewise, so 
so even in the, 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 the projects itself, you can like uh, involve with the, uh, the, the coding as well. Like we, everything is open source. So all the code is in GitHub. So, uh, so we very much welcome patches and new feature improvements and so on. So if you can, if you are like a hardcore developer, any kind of a developer, so we welcome uh, patches also. So, uh, uh, so that kind of uh, engagement is very much uh, encouraged uh, at WSO2. So, um, so several people have already done that, like they have sent patches, uh, given suggestions and so on. Um, so, uh, so that's uh, basically the model we have. So, uh, with that, so, uh, so those are the things. So, uh, mailing list, patches, so, and any other contributions, we very much welcome. Yeah, so if I just give some examples, like uh, Stack Overflow is one of the places that you can ask questions. So, if you put, put, uh, use hash WSO2, then it will always come to us, like if you have a problem in. So that's, that's also evolving a lot, so we also uh, respond to those stuff. Apart from the support, like if, uh, if you are a customer, then you have a support account, so that has some SLAs as well, but Stack Overflow obviously doesn't have SLAs, but we also actively try to uh, answer the questions of the open source community that is available, and even, with, if, if, even if you are not getting answers from us, there are community members who also answer your questions, so you might have can find similar problems and uh, solutions out there as well. So that is also one mean that we can work on. And we, uh, I, I also to told this in the talk, like we have the Kafka, RabbitMQ adapters are, are contributed by our, uh, uh, by our customers and open source users. Like, so those are not initially implemented by us. And then we uh, took that in and then we did some refactoring and, and merged that code. So, Basically, like if you have any 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 organizational protocols or any any different things, you are mostly welcome. Like you can send those things to us, and we might some do might to, need to do some generalization if it needed, and then we'll you add it to the product as well, like so that we can maintain it cleanly going forward. So those are those are the like um, when it comes to the contributions and uh, communication. I think those are the uh, uh, initial steps that you can do. And if you really, really um, want to go deep into that, then even, you, like for example, Siddhi, you can just check it out and uh, send pull request and go ahead and work on those aspects as well. So, like, um, so, it, 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 so it, since it's, there is an open Jenkins build and all the products are open source and free available, it's, there's no, nothing restricting you to use it or extend it or contribute back on those. So uh, let me quickly touch back in the one technical question that we didn't actually discuss on the panel so far, which is actually machine learning and predictive analytics. Uh, I think from the both the use cases um, and the use cases, uh, from the Uber use case and also the few use cases, Francisco talked about telemetry use case, et cetera. Uh, I'm sure there's like, there's some relationships into machine learning and maybe even it's not used right now, there are uh, possibilities of using etc. Could you like comment about like how do you think machine learning uh, come into the picture and affect in these use cases? Oh, okay. Machine learning. Machine learning. Yes. Uh, yeah. So actually, in my team, there's also also other people doing uh, machine learning, and in which they need to. Um, basically train the model. Uh, and what we were considering is, uh, so um, one of the use cases we think about of like using real-time event process, uh, complex event processing, it's uh, you can use like uh, the offline machine learning model uh, that is trained and then to do online prediction. Um, so that I think, I remember City have extension uh, for doing that. Um, so, yeah, but we uh, never tried it out. Okay. Uh, but I think that's one of the potential that, I mean, uh, the <coughs> offline machine learning can be integrated into uh, the uh, complex event processing uh, to, for online prediction. Yeah, absolutely. So, Francis? Uh, yes, I, I think that the basis is, is the knowledge. You know? So, when you define uh, a knowledge around uh, a contest, 
and uh, with uh, every type model you like. In the case of URA, we, we use WL. You, you start from a point that in the future you want somehow get additional knowledge on this uh, context you have defined. And uh, of course, uh, it's really relevant in a, in a landscape where you have also a complex event processing. I try to do an example on the telematics I, do, I, I mentioned before. It's uh, really difficult to understand uh, if uh, someone has stopped, uh, a car is stopped uh, because it has a problem or because it wants to stop. Mm -hmm. In this case, the complex event processing itself could not yeah. help. Having a machine learning help you to acquire every time new knowledge on the type of stop until you define when a stop is uh, uh, a stop due to some problem or a stop because the driver will to stop. So I think that with this example is clear how the two components has to be together. One, in one component you define the stop. In the other, you, uh, every time there is a stop, you have additional information to understand the type of stop. I don't know if uh, I explain my point of view. So also in this case we have two different components that together give you the possibility to define additional use case, of course. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think what you mean is that there are some, some problems, like you can't put a rule, write down a rule to do it, but you could make a more statistical exactly. decision exactly. out of it. Uh, exactly. Yes. Uh, so, okay, the, uh, we have like only a few minutes left. Last chance to ask any questions if you have. Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's supposed to be another one on the back. When, when you are in the initial stages for, uh, for example, adopt some technologies related to complex event processing, uh, what are the the things that you need to start to, to, to work, for example, uh, before dealing with uh, a, a tool or platform. Uh, uh, for example, if you have different so, uh, sources when you are, need to start to collect that data, uh, what, what we need to, to, to think about, the, what is the most important, the, the best practice, for example, we need to define a unique way to collect all the data for different sources, or start to thinking first in an architectural layer, or data layer, what are the, the best practice? Yeah, I don't know, I can answer from architectural perspective, that is my work. I suggest in this case to have uh, a clear lambda architecture. That means a speed layer, that is where you have a window of your last, let it decide, up to you, depends on your business, and a batch layer though, where you have your historical data. Uh, and uh, you can combine in real time a short window in the fast layer that usually is a NoSQL database and an in-memory database with the historical data coming from the historical analytics that usually is done with Hadoop, with Hadoop distribution. Choose whatever you want. I don't want to sponsor any of this, uh, of this platform. On top of the fast layer and batch layer, you can build whatever complex, uh, complex analysis you want, having historical and, and batch data. The part beyond, the, the streaming part, let's say it's a support. It's not so much uh, related to your uh, uh, business need that are at the complex event, complex event layer. So if I have to figure, imagine the streaming process down, two layer, fast and batch layer. On top of this, the complex event processing, the machine learning, and on top, an API layer to access all the capabilities of this platform I try to, to describe now with a standard API, inbound and outbound, if you want to push some action to, to the user. So, for example, uh, in the mining industry, if you want to understand that there is a, a problem uh, digging before that something got wrong, you analyze the last 10 minutes of working of, uh, 
of uh, your, your tools with uh, the historical data respect to when arrived to a broken moment. You understand that there is a problem, you trigger with an API some, some clients say, okay, stop digging because you have, you have uh, a problem. But I try to figure out a sort of logical view on how I design a, an architecture able to give contextual information. So any other last questions? Okay, sure. So uh, if you want, like, uh, so that's on the architectural perspective. So on, on the other side, like for example, if you have uh, some lot of data, and if you want to analyze some stuff, I would say it, it would be a more of an incremental and like, uh, this go, you have to go through iterations. Like first you have to collect the data that you have and try to see what you can do out of that. And maybe the things that you want to analyze my, the, those data might not be enough to identify those cases. So you, you might need to go back and collect some manual information. Like, so, so your business need might be more, like they, might, they want to know several things, but the data must, might not show, like from the data you can't derive those things. So the data collection is not just one time process, but the data has okay. to be enriched in, 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 in iterations so that you can basically achieve what you really want to. So, so it should not just be like, okay, I get these logs and this and then do it. Maybe like then you have to learn the logs more or maybe even you have to annotate your system to add more logs on the, those aspects uh, so that you can basically get some insights onto that. Okay, that's one more. Okay, last time. I'm new to uh, see the query language, actually. I'm new to analytics, too. Um, but I'm working on a problem or like analysis. Um, it requires me to do a lot of computations, like timestamp conversions, like basic mathematic functions and everything based on some taking five, some five coordinates or something. Um, when I look at the uh, uh, options available for me, R seem to be uh, uh, do everything what I wanted to do, um, and I can plot the graphs and everything what I can do. Uh, how well does the CD uh, compares with the computations that I could perform in R? Um, so how do you compare these two? Can you can you repeat it? Like I can. Um, how do you compare uh, the features that are? provided uh, out of the box through CD query language yeah. with uh, the features that I could do uh, the computations in uh, the core R language. Um, so how well do these two compare? Yeah. You're basically asking CD versus R? Yes. Yeah. So. Um, so, so CD is basically a Java library. So we predominantly have, um, like we have, we, he, with experience, we came out with several scenarios. Like when it comes to timestamp, uh, we should be able to get the current timestamp, timestamp conversions, zone conversions, and a lot of timestamp related operations. So there is a time extension that we have written just to cover all of those cases. So we just look into uh, Java and whatever the functions that is there, we have converted into CD. Likewise, when it comes to string manipulations, like regular expressions, and a lot of lots of those things are also included. So, so when it comes to data management and stuff like mathematical operations, uh, like Java Math library and uh, strings and the regular expressions, and uh, all of those are available. And we also have unit conversions uh, stuff coming into this as well. So. We have predominantly used the um, um, used Siddhi to basically add them as first level functionalities to achieve performance. But at the same time, like uh, we also have scripting support, so we can script with uh, JavaScript, and also we can run R itself within C like as as a, as a script inside uh, Siddhi. So we have these functions, like you can. I have not shown that in the examples, but you can say. Uh, define a function in line and basically give a small r function in that and which will which will actually execute in the pipeline so the scala r and 
um, Java scripts are supported that way. But we don't really encourage that to use a lot because since there is a, it's a different program, there is a little bit of performance degradation because it goes from this to that to, and back to here. But it's still fast uh, when it compared to like a network call, but even like it's not like native natively inside the language, like if you want to get millisecond latencies, it may be a problem, but if you are okay with seconds, you are totally go, you can go with those things. So, uh, so, so those kinds, since we have an extension like that, so you can basically use that, or else um, writing a UDF is, is like a single a small Java class itself, so you can easily implement that. So that is also one of another, another u reason, like why CD is so popular, because the UDF creation and extension is way too easy and it's, you can easily extend that. Hope I, did I answer your question? Yeah, thank you. I mean, I'll still uh, in the evaluation phase, like I'll go home probably <laughs> download it and check it out, compare both and what I can do in one versus the other. Okay. And uh, probably I hope to use probably uh, Siddhi as a wrapper for all my R functions. Uh, maybe we could do that. I don't know. I'll check that. Thank you. Yeah, so if R is, um, it doesn't work on the real time case, right? So if you want to use the R's capability in real time, the same thing you can uh, code it in Siddhi and use that. Yeah, yeah m my use case pretty much analyzing the historical data. Yeah, it's based on some five coordinates you take to the math. That's, that's all it is, yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. So let me thank Sui, Francisco, and uh, Suho and Anjana for the join and uh, sharing their opinions. Also, thanks very much everybody for joining us. And so we are closing the panel, but if you want to chat about anything or want to know anything, please feel free to come and talk to us. Thanks very much. <laughs>